people a second to realize we're back. Uh, and I want to thank Kevin Whitmore here for his patience. Uh, live technology has not been our friend this year. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, do we know where they last uh, were able to hear Kevin? Uh, yeah, I actually went and checked the, uh, the thing and saw where it cut out. Okay, so Kevin actually knows where they last heard him, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, I think i uh, just give a few seconds here to hopefully of course. Let, let people get their alerts that we're back in business uh, and hope that the gremlins from hell do not, uh, <laughs> or I guess I should say the creatures of the night in this case, do not, uh, do not pose any further issues for us here. Um, and thank you all out there for uh, your, your patience with us. So I think people are starting to trickle back in. Lovely. I'm just checking all the various <laughs> <laughs> platforms. Uh, All right, Kevin, why don't you uh, take us back just slightly, I think, if you would sure. be so kind. Uh, well, we, we can just start right here. This is where I was transitioning into. So this is probably a good point to begin. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the break. Uh, <laughs> gird your loins, because we're about to go deep into the vampire's performer. Dracula set the model, in fact, for the vampire's performer. And pop culture has embraced the idea of the vampire as actor from Blackula in the 70s to Jerry Dandridge in Fright Night and Max in the Lost Boys in the 80s, to the eternal high school students of Twilight. Still in high school and you're 120 years old? Man, vampirism's not the only curse in your life. The <laughs> vampire performs at being human. In fact, this is the basis of the joke for regular human bartender Jackie Daytona, who serves regular human beer. The vampires of what we do in the shadows are so cluelessly unaware that they do not understand what horrible performers they are at trying to play human the joke is, of course, that humans are even more monumentally stupid, though, and so they are able to pass as just odd people. Uh, and when they can't, of course, they can use their mesmerism to say, you do not remember any of this. Similarly, the sexy vampires of Key and Peele have a self-realization moment when the new vampire, Terrell, uh, tells the other vampires they're just trying too hard, and the whole sexy vampire thing just seems desperate and gratuitous, as they insist on wearing leather pants with laces up the side and sunglasses at night in the dark and playing the same techno song for two years in a row. Uh, it's, it's, it's just so much. Why are you guys acting so hard? And that's kind of the whole point. These two parody moments tell us something about the vampire. And that something is, of course, the vampire is a performer. The vampire is either trying very much not to seem like a vampire or trying very much like to seem like a vampire. In fact, the only offstage moment for the vampire is in the casket. Otherwise, like a fading comedian, the vampire is always on. Oddly, we do have, uh, and then the second point, of course, is performing the vampire live on stage, which you can see here in the lower photograph, that uh, we perform the vampire by having an actor embody a character that is from some work of fiction or that comes from the screenwriter or scriptwriter. And oddly, in fact, I want to turn now to productions of Dracula, which are sort of the heart of what I want to talk about today. And we have both, the, we have the movies to thank for the stage and film versions of Dracula. Florence Stoker, Bram's widow, Oscar Wilde's ex-girlfriend, was so pissed that a German adaptation of her husband's novel was made without permission, or more importantly, without paying for the rights. She sued to get royalties from Nosferatu, uh, WF, F.W. Murnau's classic silent film about Count Orlock, obviously based on Stoker's novel. Failing to get royalties, she secured a promise that all prints of the film, including the negative, would be destroyed. And thank goodness she failed at that. In the meantime, in 1924, during her battles with Prana Film, she gave the stage rights of the novel to Hamilton Dean. Uh, both demonstrate her ownership of the rights for the same reason that Stoker performed Dracula as a, a staged reading back in 80, uh, 97, and also to get some money. Um, she owned the bulk of the income from the stage performances of Dracula, which was her primary source of income uh, towards the end of her life. 
Hamilton Dean, a member of the Henry Irving Company in 1899, had become a manager and writer in his own right by the early 20s. He adapted the novel, opening first in the provinces before bringing the show to London's Little Theatre with Raymond Huntley in the title role and Dean himself playing Abraham van Helsing. They transferred then to the Duke of York's Theatre and then the Prince of Wales Theatre, and the show was brought to the United States with additional script changes by John Balderston to make the script more comprehensible for Americans. The version premiered on Broadway to the same acclaim, acclaim that Dean's version did in London. And this play was then revived in 1979 on Broadway with Frank Langella in the title role, which you can see down here, slightly blocked, and then replaced later on by Raul Julia uh, with designs, of course, by Edward Gorey. In the interest of my thesis on Dracula's existence as inherently theatrical, I want to note that the star of the Broadway version of the play, Hungarian actor Bela Blasco, had been cast in the title role and changed his name to Bela Lugosi and achieved critical success in the role. When Carl Lamely Jr. purchased the motion picture rights to Dracula based on the play, not on Stoker's novel. So let's be clear on this. The 1931 Universal film is not based on Stoker's novel. It is a filmed adaptation of the Dean Balderston play. And the challenge about the play is it's an adaptation. Stoker's novel is huge. All right. It's uh, epistolary. It contains telegrams, journal entries, newspaper clippings, even a wax cylinder recording. Dean and Balderston had to take all of this, this massive 400 page book and get it down to two hours traffic on the stage in a naturalistic setting. So they cut out all the stuff in Transylvania. They cut out the return to the Borgo Pass. They keep it simple. It's on sort of two or three sets. It's all set in living rooms. It's very naturalistic. It's very Henrik Ibsen, had Ibsen written vampire plays. <laughs> so when Lamerly purchases the rights to Dracula, Lamerly Sr., his father and the founder of Universal Studios, wanted Lon Chaney to play the Count. Chaney was Universal's big horror guy. Chaney, however, passed away before filming. So Lamerly Sr. grudgingly said the Broadway actor can do it, I guess, thus forever linking Dracula with Lugosi and Lugosi with Dracula and setting the standard for all film adaptations that will follow. Let us remember the 1931 Universal film, again, not adapted from the novel, but from the dramatic adaptation of the novel, the play. And here's where we get to the heart of the argument contained in my subtitle. Dracula is cemented in pop culture's mind from Lugosi's performance in the 31 Universal film and the Broadway run before it. There have been many other Draculas since. Christopher Lee, center here in the Hammer films, John Carradine, uh, a mustachio Dracula, Gary Oldman as a hipster Dracula, uh, Jack Palance as a Jack Palance Dracula, and of course, most recently, Clay's Bang in the BBC Dracula. When Dracula is evoked or invoked or illustrated, it is none of these that are pictured or presented. These are not our Dracula. This is Dracula. Whenever we're doing a riff on Dracula, this is Dracula. Tuxedo, formal wear, of course, with a cape, collar up. All right, Dracula's born for the 80s, man. He pops his collar. He's got a widow's peak. He's got slick back hair. He's got an Eastern European accent. He is pale with no hair anywhere other than that slick back hair. He's aristocratic and again, formal wear. I mean, from childhood, we are shown that this is Dracula. Good Lord. Tangentially, Count von Count is actually a fairly accurate take on Dracula, the foreign count who lives among the residents of a neighborhood and everyone's okay because they don't realize that he's a vampire. But there's a vampire living on Sesame Street. We have a, a, a chocolate cereal enthusiast, an Adam Sandler film series, a children's show. These are vampires, but here's the catch. How the vampire is described in Stoker's novel and the image of Lugosi on Broadway are two very different things. That image is sharpened in film, but it is on stage that our image of Dracula is formed. The novel, Dracula is described as a tall old man, clean shaven, save for a long white mustache. What? Yeah, Dracula's got a long white mustache. He should be looking like Sam Elliott. All right. Lemmy from Motorhead, clad from black, clad in black from head to toe without a single speck of color about him anywhere. He doesn't wear a cape in the novel. Just once, when he is at his castle, uh, Jonathan Harker looks out a window, turns his head to the side and sees Dracula crawling down the wall like a lizard, it says. And he has a cape behind him that's sort of flapping in the breeze that makes him look kind of like a bat. And Harker freaks out, but it's primarily lizard-like. And then never again does he wear a cape. He just walks around in all black clothing. He's lupine and wolfen looking with bushy hair. 
Yeah, bushy hair, a unibrow, and hairy palms. He's got a dome po forehead, pointy ears, and a sharp teeth. And sharp teeth. Later on in the novel, when he's in London, he's got a beard with a white streak. And yet, when Bella Lugosi is on stage, this is what we get. This is our Dracula. We don't picture Dracula as this. There's no stash, right? There's no unibrow. There's no hairy palms. There's no dome forehead. Maybe pointy ears. Maybe a little. Certainly no beard, no facial hair whatsoever. You can't see his palms, but I assure you, there is no hair on them. So the image is sharpened for the film, but it is on stage that our image of Dracula is informed. And by the way, tangentially, spoiler alert, Dracula is killed not with a stake through the heart in the novel. He is stabbed with a Bowie knife. Then he turns to dust, which means that he might not even be dead because A, we've seen Dracula turn to dust before and B, Van Helsing doesn't say stabbing in the heart with a Bowie knife because one of the people who kills him is a Texan has a Bowie knife. Like, Let's kill a vampire, uh, stabs him in the heart and, and they, they try to slit his throat and cut off his head and he turns to dust. Stoker actually planned on writing a sequel in which Dracula survives and goes to the United States, uh, but he did not because he kind of died before he could do it. Um, Lucy gets a stake through the heart, the blue for lady, but not the count until he hits the stage. It is on the stage that virtually every adaptation of Dracula has a stake, not a knife going into his heart at play's end. And speaking as a Van Helsing myself, it is very satisfactory to pound that stake home every night, especially if the coffin is rigged to spray blood in your face. Don't ask how I know. Which brings me to my third point. The vampire on stage is a scary thing and for my money more effective than the movies. And the reason is quite simple. The vampire on stage is a remarkable thing, even in comedies and parodies, as what distinguishes the theater from film and literature is embodiment. When you are sitting in the theater down in the front row here, that vampire is walking right towards you in the same shared space. Riven and Dracula are not physically in the same space when you read their novels. In a movie theater, colored lights on a wall with a soundtrack, or if you're at home, pixels on the screen can be spooky, can unnerve you, can give you a jump scare or fright. But in the theater, there is an embodied presence in your proximity. Dracula can reach out and touch you. The funny thing is I'm a theater guy and as a director I love to have sort of stuff go out in the audience. When I directed Evil Dead the musical here in Los Angeles the first three rows were the splash zone. Everyone got a poncho uh, and by the end of the play if you sat in the first three rows you look like Carrie. However one of the things I hate as an audience member is to be subjected to that sort of thing. I'm a hypocrite I know. But the point is, in the theater, stuff doesn't come off the screen because there's no screen. Stuff comes off the stage. The, the vampires can be in your presence. The brain knows that this is just an actor. There's something about incarnation, though, if I may be so bold and blasphemous. It's the word of Stoker made flesh that is uncanny, unsettling. It can be weird if you're at a college, you know, hey, there's that kid from my poli sci class playing Dracula. But even when it's a celebrity in the role, in that same space as you, there is a presence, a thing that is there. Even in a low budget sixth grade production performed in your school's cafetorium without a set, there is an embodied vampire in the room, a physical presence. We see this used to great effect. If I might use a different example in a play like Stephen Malatrat's adaptation of Susan Hill's The Woman in Black, which has run in London for years. The eponymous character doesn't speak. She's not even acknowledged in the program, sorry, spoiler. But one is very much aware that she is there. And then you begin to wonder where she is or if she's there. You begin to look behind you, which people should never do in a theater. Like theaters are like, oh, I'm going to just face the stage and never turn around. And in theater, you start looking around going, is she here now? And that's wonderful because it renders the experience eerie and uncanny. And whereas film engages sight and sound, the experience in the theater is, if I may use a challenging word, sensual. It's not just real bodies moving through space. Smart actors and directors use smell to create an environment. The blood is there, we see it splatter, we hear it. In fact, I saw a particularly effective production of Dracula in Pittsburgh in which the vampire was shot with a pistol on stage. A squib in the shirt ensured blood spatter from the bullet going into the body. But then the vampire began choking and coughing and spit out the bullet, which skittered across a table and fell on the floor near the audience. And you just saw the whole audience as one just immediately try and move away from this horrible thing we had just seen. The effect is so easy and so simple, it's stupid. Prop gun, a squib, and a candy root beer barrel palmed and then put in the mouth while the vampire begins coughing and then he just spits it out. Root beer barrel looks exactly like a bullet, don't ask how I know. And yet in the moment, in the theater, profoundly effective. And let us be honest, 
part of the appeal of the vampire play from the 1820s on is not just the promise of being in a room with an actual vampire. It's the promise of being in the room with vampire victims, the promise of the salacious, the forbidden, the naughty, the victims in their bodies, so to speak, just as fl slasher films in the 80s played to teenage audiences' desires for sex and violence, blood and breasts, if you will. Dracula, Riven and the women they seduced and bit and sucked and fed off of were part of the appeal for audiences as well. An advertisement for an 1826 English production of Planchet's The Vampire reads in part, this piece is founded on, uh, this piece is founded on the various traditions concerning the vampires. They are permitted to roam the earth in whatever form they please with italics supernatural powers of fascination. And they cannot be destroyed as long as they sustain their dreadful existence by imbibing the blood of female victims. Yeah, why female victims? Vampires can drink anyone. Well, there it is, isn't it? Salacious, suggestive of the advertising of horror films from the 50s to the present. Monsters with powers to make people do things. People like beautiful women in their nightwear. Part of the appeal, the pleasure of horror stage horror is that if the vampire body is horrific and uncanny and right there in front of you, the bodies of his victims are sensual and equally physically present. I mean, sort of the, the slide here that's I think kind of hidden by us from Tans de Vampire, her neck is exposed, her neckline or decolletage hidden slightly by her pulling a red cloak in front of her body, but it is clear she is in a nightgown and she is terrified but in an ecstasy. It is the victim as much as the vampire that we go to see because we're not supposed to. We're seeing people in private moments. One of, for me, one of the most disturbing moments in the novel of Dracula is Harker wakes up to find Dracula in bed with him and Mina. The three of them to, are together in this sort of weird vampiric blood-sucking three-way. And you know, this is sort of the ultimate horror, of course, to Victorians. Uh, so that hint of this is something you should not see in much the same way that slasher films are, these are things you should not see or do or even be aware of. Now here they are, sit and enjoy them. Hamilton Dean tangentially also came up with a great gimmick that movies would not figure out until the 1950s that turned out to be both a great publicity stunt as well as an example of the power of persuasion. Dean had the Queen Alexandra Hospital just down the street from the Duke of York's theater where Dracula was being performed send a nurse to every performance. She was visible in the lobby as the audience entered and they brought her into the theater at the start of the show and it was loudly announced that she was there to care for anyone who faints from th fright. If you felt lightheaded or if the play was too much, please go out to the lobby. Now, this was something that I'd done before at the French theater, the Théâtre de Grand Guignol, French's famous theater of fear and terror. If you don't know about the Théâtre de Grand Guignol, please, for the love of God, go out and do some research. There's a great film on uh, Netflix called The Most Assassinated Woman in the World about Moxa, the lead actress. Um, Richard Hand and Michael Wilson have a whole series of great books. Uh, and Mel Gordon has a wonderful book, Learn About the Grand Guignol. It's this fascinating theater that went from 1897, roughly the same time as Dracula, to 1960, and specialized in, for all practical purposes, what are slasher plays, insane people killing and mutilating and murdering, uh, you know, average folks. Um, so Dean stole an idea here, have a nurse in the theater. And of course, by accentuating that, by saying there, she's here in case you need her, Indeed, some folks did eventually end up needing her services, which then adds to the mystique of the play. If the 19th century was done by stage ruins, ruins, excuse me, and the early 20th century by stage Draculas, the past 50 years have seen an explosion in both the number and variety of stage vampires. And here I share a brief but random sampling of what is out there now. 80s pop fans know a bit of a uh, aborted attempt to adapt Nosferatu to the stage in the late 60s. Jim Steinman, the composer and producer of the song Total Eclipse of the Heart. Thank you, I have now just introduced that earworm to you tonight and you will not get it out of your heart until you ram a stake through its heart. Wrote, I was trying to come up with a love song and I remembered I actually wrote uh, a vampire love song. Its title was Vampires in Love. Let me just repeat that. The original title of Total Eclipse of the Heart was Vampires in Love. He was working on a musical about Nosferatu, that other great vampire story, his words, Dracula being the other one. If anyone listens to the lyrics, says Jim, they're really vampire lines. It's all about darkness, the power of darkness, and love's place in the dark. And certainly, if our culture has done anything from Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is really Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, it has very little to do with those Stokers, uh, to um, Twilight, to True Blood, to The Underworld, it's that vampire stories are really love stories. 
The song was later used in a musical called Tens de Vampires, Dance of the Vampires, an adaptation of Roman Polanski's Fearless Vampire Kills, Killers. It was eventually on stage, and I understand Matthew has actually seen it, uh, with, with Michael Crawford, the Phantom, playing a vampire. Uh, Steinman's aborted attempt to create a musical based on Nosferatu set the stage for others making more successful attempts. It is a truth universally acknowledged, uh, says um, Kate and Donaldson, Kaylee Donaldson, excuse me, uh, parodying, of course, the opening of um, Pride and Prejudice, that vampires and musicals don't mix. But Kaylee could not be more wrong. There are many, 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 many vampire musicals, operas, and even ballets, adaptations of Dracula, children's musical versions of Dracula, Tans des, vamp da tans des Vampires, as seen here. Uh, in the interest of time, because we lost time, I'm not going to jump into all of those, but I also want to point out in Brooklyn, New York, uh, the Vampire Cowboys Theater Company. They are neither vampires nor cowboys, nor do their plays contain vampire cowboys, except for all the ones that do. That is quoted from their manifesto. In fact, do yourself a favor. If, you, if, if you're bored one day and just web surfing, look up Vampire Cowboys Manifesto. It is one of the funniest and best theater company manifestos you will ever read. And they do have several vampire plays for Gen X, Millennials, and Gen Z folk. Personal fave, being a Shakespearean, Living Dead in Denmark, Quee Gwyn's wonderful play in which Hamlet is a vampire. And so Juliet, Lady Macbeth, and Desdemona show up in Denmark to train Ophelia to be a vampire hunter. Uh, here's a tangential plug, as long as I'm men mentioning stuff. I have an essay in the book Shakespearean Echoes on Shakespeare and vampires. And you might be surprised how many different novels, plays, graphic novels, intermix Shakespeare's vampires, everything from positing Shakespeare himself as a vampire to writing vampire versions of Shakespeare's stories. Uh, Quiguin also has a play called Soul Samurai, featuring a young Asian American woman trained in the martial arts who fights, fights vampires in post-apocalyptic New York City. But what I find most insane, there exist hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of vampire plays for children and young audiences. And perhaps this is part of my disconnect from vampires as a horror fan. I really associate vampires with children, not in a scary way, like scary kids are scary. If you've seen uh, uh, to uh, Toby Hooper's version of Salem's Lot, vampire kids can be really scary. Lost Boys, scary. Not these. Dracula, based on the book by Dram Stoker, John Matera. Uh, adapting Dracula for children comes from the same impulse. The familiarity or over-familiarity of the character in the story allows the adapters to play. And whether we like it or not now, The King of Vampires is a breakfast cereal, a numbers enthusiast of a Muppet, staple of animated television, and as I mentioned earlier, an Adam Sandler movie series. Just give me a minute. Okay, sorry. The challenge, therefore, for an adapter is to find ways to reinvent and reinvest the horror and uncanniness of the count. Not an easy task. The overfamiliarity with Dracula makes comedy easy. Once the monster has lost his mystery, it becomes familiar and humorous, which also lends it to children's theater. And children's theater is Dracula domesticated, a vampire made safe. Stoker's, Stoker's vampire is proud of his role in history, a Transylvanian and Romanian nationalist capable of discussion on a great deal of subjects. When he's first introduced in the novel, he greatly impresses Harker with his erudition, and he charms the people of London when he first arrives. That's one of the crazy things about Lugosi's portrayal is in the novel, Dracula works very hard, I'm about to date myself here like Rick Springfield, to lose his accent when he arrives in the new country. He tries very hard to blend in and sound more British. So reduced Dracula is none of these things. For kids, he's reduced to the component elements. His appearance, which we've already determined, is derived from Bela Lugosi. The fact that he drinks blood, can turn into a bat or a wolf or mist, cannot be seen in a mirror and can be killed by sunlight or a stake. In other words, Stoker's historic, complex, monstrous anti-hero is reduced down to just being a vampire with vampire elements, and that's all he is. He's a vampire interested in Lucy, Mina, and maybe some other women. What happens to these plays, therefore, is the infantilization of the vampire. He's not an actor or an ancient erudite aristocrat. In these plays, both victim and vampires are children. The latter is a monstrous one, an orally fixated id who flies into rages, temper tantrums, dare I say, makes demands, wants to consume and possess all, is irrational and violent. This is not a modern vampire, but the vampire as child, and child is vampire. As a result, we get stage adaptations with no gore, no violence, merely a teenage Dracula who is super annoyed that nobody wants him to drink blood, and everybody totally sucks, pardon the pun. So these straightforward reductive adaptations for young audiences, of which there are hundreds in English alone, have been around since the 70s. 1980, Dracula, 
uh, based on the book by Bram Stoker is very little based on the book by Bram Stoker. It just takes the elements from it. Uh, William Bink Nolte's adaptation is arguably one of the most produced. Written in 2008, it has already had 219 productions, predominantly high school and community groups uh, in the United States and Canada, as well as in Ireland and Indonesia. McNulty was the resident artist at uh, the Actors Theatre of Louisville when he wrote this play uh, in 2008. And the funny thing is, if you go to the webpage, the rights holders promoting the play say, and this is a quote, this adaptation is an action-packed, blood-soaked retelling of Bram Stoker's classic tale of horror. And yet somehow high schools love it, despite blood-soaking not being a quality most schools seek out. Stephen Huckner's 1978 adaptation Dracula is actually a trilogy of one acts, Escape from Dracula's Castle, which is a story of Jonathan Harker, Death at the Crossroads, and the Death of Lucy Wen uh, Wenstrom, uh, which is sort of a corruption of Lucy with Stenra. Um, they can be performed individually as one acts or combined into a full-length version. Tim Kelly's Dracula the Vampire play premiered in London's West End for adult audiences in 1978, a year before the Broadway revival of the Dean Balderston script, and was aimed at mature audiences, but since has become a staple of high schools. It's topped McNulty's version, by having almost a thousand performances in the last 30 years. Dracula is also very busy in adaptations and not so inspired sequels and reimagining. He gets around a lot. I was a teenage Dracula, Dracula in Love, Dracula in Paradise. He's in Hawaii, I believe in that one. Drax back, midlife Dracula. The Count will rise again or Dracula in Dixie where he finally does make it to America down south. The Passion of Dracula. And of course the musical, The Dracula Spectacula. Sorry, I felt the need to do jazz hands at the end of that one. John Fleming's terrifying Dracula was actually been done at uh, New Rochester, New York's Push Physical Theater. And the question is how much given, how much of the idea of Dracula has been separated from the horror of Stoker, Stoker's novel and now been transformed into a fun vampire? Because, uh, and this is a quote from a review, Dracula demands a level of processing about issues that people uh, at about 13 or so have not encountered or are only beginning to encounter. Devotion to good and the temptation of evil, of faith and reason, of sexuality and sensuality, of death, Death of the Body and Death of the Soul. In fact, in 2018, the Columbus Children's Theater in Ohio did Stephen Dietz's Dracula, the same Dracula that I did professionally here in Los Angeles. And uh, just looking here at um, Margaret, ooh, sorry, too far already. Looking at Margaret Quam's review, it's a tricky choice for a children's theater to carry off. CCT recommends the show for kids in fourth grade or older. And certainly those younger than that shouldn't be there. The deaths, assaults, and bloodletting, not to mention the eerie darkness and some remarkable special effects, are likely to give younger viewers nightmares, and parents would be well advised to consider their individual children before deciding whether this is an appropriate show, even for those older than nine or ten. Because this is an accurate rendition of a flowery 19th century text, it's loaded with language that elementary school kids aren't likely to have heard. And flashbacks and jumps in time are likely to be confusing. At nearly two and a half hours, the plane would strain the patience of some young theater goers. And let's be honest, it would strain the patience of this not so young theater goer. For any and all of the reasons above, several families walked out during the first act of Thursday's opening night performance. That said, for anyone wishing to experience an authentic Dracula, that's a highly problematic term. This one fits the bill. Dietz's script moves fluidly from Transylvania to London and back, navigating leaps in time with ease, and the production directed by Pamela Hill wrenches its emotional content to the edge of melodrama without falling into parody. So vampires are performative, theatrical, creatures of the stage. Here, another What We Do in the Shadows reference. The Nouveau Théâtre des Vampires, because as you know, the original Théâtre des Vampires from Anne Rice's series was destroyed. But of course, the vampires of New England have created a new one uh, that our heroes go and see. The vampire lives its undeath very happily on stage, whereas an embodied presence, it can be rendered far more uncannily than in film and in video. And I hope, as I have shown tonight, much of what people think they know about Dracula comes not from the novel, but originally from the stage adaptation, then made into a Hollywood movie. And of course, vampires are first and foremost performative. Thank you. Celebrating 221 years of stage vampires, I am a regular human uh, horror scholar, Kevin Wentmore, thanking you for joining us tonight. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, do you, you have a little bit of time for some questions? I know we're certainly, uh, certainly, a certainly. delayed here. <laughs> Not at all. Um, uh, first question, I, I'm just curious, when did you direct The Evil Dead, the musical? I want to say 2000 and, oh, 2012, I think. I saw that too. <laughs> I saw your production then. Cool. <laughs> Small world. And I sat in the splatter zone. 
Thank you. That was, <laughs> if, if you had come on the last night, we had uh, several gallons of leftover stage flow. We thought we had like figured out how much we were going to use each night. But on the very last performance, uh, my, my blood guy was like, we have all this leftover blood, to which my sole direction was use it. Uh, <laughs> so it was coming down off the false proscenium in sheets. Uh, during the grand finale, a song called Do the Necronomicon, where everyone's dying all over and over and over again. Uh, blood was just spraying into the front rows nonstop. That's just, it's, it's just a, such a small, small world. It's, it's it is. Kind of it is really funny. Uh, that one and um, Silence, the, the musical so, version I, of Silence. Yeah, of the that Land. was a fun one. Did, I don't know when you were in Los Angeles, did you get to see uh, Reanimator the musical, which was I directed did. by Stuart Gordon at the Steve Allen Theater? That was another fun one. That uh, again, there are so many uh, horror musicals out there, and the problem with virtually all of them, uh, especially Carrie being the most famous example. They, they don't work as horror. It's very hard to be scared when, you know, there's a ghost emerging from out of the dark. You know, the ring would fail if suddenly Sadako or Samara was like, I'm down the well, you know, and has to start singing. It just doesn't work. Uh, so the tendency is to go camp and you end up with Silence the Musical, Evil Dead the Musical is high camp. Um, I've seen, I think, three different version musical exorcists, none of which have been particularly effective. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that working at all <laughs> um yeah that just I, I made a note to ask because i was just like did i see that <laughs> i did oh thank you um i guess uh going back to the start of the talk here um with polidori uh and the, the idea that uh, another model for the vampire in his case was byron himself right oh yes Paul polidori it's funny, the sort of the two most famous literary vampires other than Carmilla um, from uh, Le Sheridan uh, were based on sort of their, their boss, their mentor, their best friend with whom they had this very complicated kind of love-hate relationship. So Polidori model Riven, who's a lord, just like Lord Byron, on Byron, um, to the point where a lot of people thought that Byron had written it and was kind of autobiographical because Byron took a great deal of pride in being naughty and being flamboyant in his flouting of authority. Uh, and so Polidori himself was rather upset that he wasn't getting credit for it. And Byron himself was kind of snitty about it because he didn't want, he thought it was beneath him. He didn't want credit for it. And in fact, he was one of the first people to say, you know, the only reason people even read your novel is, is because it's on stage. They turned it into a melodrama in Paris. So the hoi polloi are happy to read it. And then Polidori did talk to him for a week or something. Uh, eventually, the two of them went their separate ways. But the, the one thing I always find fascinating about all of that is you have this sort of one event in Geneva that gives us the vampire, that gives us uh, a Byron poem about a sort of vampiric ghost monster uh, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if Shelley's, what Shelley worked on ever made it out to anything. I, you know, it was a, Shelley, Percy Shelley's didn't really come, come to anything. But the single evening produced the formative vampire novel and Frankenstein. Um, yeah, I mean, it, that, that is this weird singularity uh, in, in terms of like horror studies. The other thing I'd indicate too, in terms of Byron and like vampire legacies and things too, Byron had a pet wolf as well. He did. I, I will throw out there. Um, there's a great um, British kids show to just, right, circle to the end of your talk too, in relation to, to it's called The Horrible Histories. Uh, and they do a thing about Byron and vampires. It's called Twitlight. <laughs> Uh, that I think you might get a kick out of uh, that. I'll have to add that to my to watch list. Yeah, I mean it's very brief, but it, it's pretty funny because the whole time it's like building up like it's going to be a vampire, and he's like, "I am that thing that no one speaks of," and he's like, "Say it." She's like, "A vampire?" He's like, "No, a poet." <laughs> also very true, and they're disreputable folks at best. But Paul um, Dore, at least was a physician. You know, he was yeah. reputable, but he was a physician to a poet, which makes him. You know, distrustworthy. I don't even know if that's a word. Next question. <laughs> the The other thing with Stoker too, and in the text of uh, the actual uh, 1897 text of Dracula, is the endless Shakespearean citations. Oh, good lord! Yes. Um, to live and work with Irwin uh, Irving is to know Hamlet by heart, is to know Shylock by heart, and it's 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 a surprisingly Shakespearean text. And that's something since I plugged my uh, my Shakespeare vampire essay earlier. Uh, that's something that I talk about is just how Shakespearean Dracula is and how easy it is sort of to take Shakespeare and make him vampiric and, and connect him up to Stoker. 
uh, because, the, and again, I think culturally speaking, the educated elite of London would certainly be fluent in the major works, you know, as one attends fourth form and then sixth form. And of course, university, you will read Shakespeare at Oxford or Eton or somewhere uh, and, and be familiar with the text. Um, but not so common as to be an actor. Although let's also remember that Henry Irving was the first actor ever to be knighted. Mm -hmm. And so there is that sense of what's going on when Stoker's writing is the elevation of not all actors, but certain actors, particularly the Shakespeareans, to a level of this is someone who is contributing to the culture at the same level of a great writer or a great painter. And there is this profound distinction between a common performer who's, let's be honest, a prostitute, and a great actor who is worthy of appearing in front of a monarch. We sort of still have that, you'll forgive me for getting on my soapbox a little bit as a theater professor, we still have that disconnect in our own culture in terms of, you know, <laughs> tell people you're a theater major or an actor, and like, oh, yeah, you just want to be famous. Or, you know, it's a person who's trying to do this is looked down upon, but if someone sees their favorite actor at a restaurant or runs into them in person in an airport, they're like, oh my God, take a selfie, take a photo. It's so cool that I met this actor. So we have this really weird love-hate relationship with the actor depending on their level of success. And we really see that, not just throughout history, but especially in Stoker's time, where Irving is being elevated, but he's not always being particularly nice to Brahm. <laughs> it is, I mean, because the other thing I was gonna say about that in terms of um, British culture, I think, and maybe I, this will be a moment I put my foot in my mouth, uh, but I do that quite a lot here. Uh, he quote he, he's much better at quoting Shakespeare than he is the Bible. He gets the Bible wrong quite a lot, which I think is a very Church of England <laughs> kind of thing, right? Certainly, and certainly in in keeping with what we know of both Stoker's life and the Times, uh, he Stoker himself is is Irish and comes from Ireland, uh, was in Dublin, and of course then moves to London. But he himself was far less interested, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the woman he married, Florence Balcom was originally sort of dating and not quite engaged to um, Oscar Wilde. Uh, and so Stoker is sort of running in these, for lack of a better term, hedonistic circles with all these people. And of course, the Hellfire Club is active at this time, if you're familiar with them. Uh, there, there, there is this sort of pleasure in being decadent. And Stoker is sort of the guy who sits outside of, he's the guy who sits at the party. Stoker would have been the designated driver if Byron and Wilde and Irving were all hanging out. Stoker would have been the designated driver. He's the guy who just sort of sits there. I'm not speaking ill of designated drivers here, but he doesn't party. He just sort of sits there and quietly judges everyone and then makes sure they all get to bed safely. That's Bram Stoker. <laughs> but for him, it's not a religious thing. It's just, he really, if you read Dracula, it's so obvious. He's a very uptight Victorian gentleman. Uh, and whereas Polidori's The Vampire is all about, let's go crazy. And these vampires who are seducing and having fun with women uh, and, and it's naughty and ribald. In Stoker, it's meant to be a source of great horror that we have to protect these poor women. Once Lucy has been violated and become a vampire herself, she's now this horrible mother who goes out and murders children. And it's this beautiful, chilling moment. I don't know why people don't use more of it, where she appears to the men who used to love her, and she's this vampire woman with a necklace made of the shoes of the children she's killed. Uh, and she's trying to get back in her tomb before dawn, and they manage to grab her and hold her down. And again, she has three suitors, one of whom she is eventually going to marry, and they hold her down and pound a stake through her heart. Uh, and this is both terrifying to Stoker, and yet at the same time, I'm sure Freud is just sitting there in a corner going, yes, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, more. Well, it's weird. I mean, uh, so one thing, I, and you've, you've played Van Helsing, so perhaps I'll see what your, your take is on this. Van Helsing himself is a vampire throughout the piece. He... I mean, that, that is the theory, that Van Helsing himself is very vampiric, and uh, I, here is where I will give credit to Anthony Hopkins, um, who was a far better Van Helsing than I ever was. But in, 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 in Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, Hopkins plays him as being on the verge of being a monster himself. He's, he's zealous in his vampire hunting, but he also, dude, how do you know all this stuff, one? And two, there is a scene where he has a cape and he is spattered with blood and he is just sort of cackling with joy after they kill the blue for lady. He's like, yes, <laughs> you're going... You're into this just a little too much. Well, because I find the scene with, um, and actually, I mean, because the, the, in the book I'm working on right now, because um, the uh, the Coppola, I'm working on '90s horror movies right now, uh, and so the, the the Coppola scene is the only one that actually really deals with the the Lucy saga, which is about a quarter of the book. Um, yeah, it's if huge. you've never read the book, it's a lot of the book uh, to, to be uh, to be expurgated as it usually is. Um, but 
I find the whole scenario with her to be this uh, mirror image of the scene with Jonathan and the, the weird sisters. Mm -hmm. Three men killing one woman, three women trying to feast on one man. Yeah. And Stoker presents both of them as horror. Yeah. Uh, but Van, uh, Van Helsing, I mean, you can, I never even thought of that before. Dracula, his brides, Van Helsing, his suitors. Yep. Uh, yeah, there, there's certainly a strong parallel there. And Van Helsing is the one who comes up with these sort of crazy ideas. And he is also described as being mesmerizing. You know, he speaks and it's hypnotic and he carries forth that length, just like Dracula does as well. And as long as you're talking about it, if you've never read the novel, I, I do want to make a plug here, not for anything of mine. I believe you have Les Klinger coming up for Spooky yep. Evening soon. His uh, annotated Dracula, uh, viewers, if you have not read Dracula, treat yourself, get the annotated Dracula by Les Klinger. The book is wonderful. It's a full book, but the, the scholarly apparatus that comes along with it, the introduction and the annotations make it such a fascinating read. Uh, I had the pleasure to read it again uh, when that came out. and went, I, I feel like I appreciate this on such a different level. So if you've never read Dracula, Read it this October and get Les Klinger's annotated Dracula. It's really worth and, it. And he, and he will be on with us in a couple of weeks. There you go. And come hear Les's talk. He's a fascinating speaker as well. And just heck of a nice guy. Hey, Les, if you're watching. <laughs> um, in terms of this too, you know, the, the, the performativity of Dracula, um, Dracula does costume changes as well yep. uh, in, in the text, right? He has a fake beard that he wears. Uh, when he is the, uh, the, the carriage driver, um, mm -hmm. he steals Jonathan Harker's clothes and goes and impersonates him as well. Um, there is a whole vampire eye for the straight guy vibe going on, if I might be that vulgar, in terms of he's all about putting on these costumes and performing and making sure that the audience is aware. Uh, Dracula is always aware of his audience. Mm -hmm. And I would, I'd take it even further. It's not just the costume changes. He's very much aware of setting. Yeah. You know, Dracula is, is stages scenes, and that's why I talked about at the very beginning that the vampire performs. He doesn't just walk into a room. He's like, it needs to be this. Dracula doesn't, he, he can enter a room any way he wants, but he appears on the balcony so that he can make this very dramatic entrance that should not be possible. Uh, what? That's just good showmanship. You bring up the lizard scene, right? Where he's climbing, yes. and he, he does this several times, well, once in Jonathan's clothes. Um, <laughs> But he never does it again. He he and he's doing it's very performative in itself because he doesn't need to leave the castle that way. Nope. He's choosing to specifically because he has an audience and it's part of like the psychological torture of Jonathan Harker. Indeed. And it's it's you know, the the, the book talks about at heart the definition of Dracula is is the cruelty. So he is a person who takes a great well, he's an entity that takes a great deal of pleasure in performing first at being a regular human aristocrat in, in the Transylvanian uh, mountains, but uh, then takes a great deal of pleasure playing the vampire lord. And he does this knowing, you know, when once he, they've started to destroy his coffins in the book, um, he lets them know, you're not going to win. I am going to destroy all of you. And and waits, you know, he, he lets Harker wake up and see him, not just see him, but see Mina drinking from his chest. And it is this yeah. sort of, you know, this, this desire to let, let Harker know I've cuckolded at you and now you get to watch me. So, well, the other thing, I mean, that, that scene is, appears three separate times too. We, we get that scene told to us twice by Dr. Seward. Uh, and then I think the other time is uh, Van Helsing. Mm -hmm. So Stoker keeps going back to it for a reason, but also the, the impression is really made that Dracula is performing. Mm -hmm. He would not, Dracula would not do half the stuff he does if he didn't have an audience. No, I, th I think that's absolutely true. And I think, you know, it's one of these things that get, gets lost too in the, uh, the post Murnau Dracula with the introduction of these, the sun uh, being the thing that can kill Dracula. Which of um, course is not in the novel. Dracula walks no. around in the sun and uh, all the time. I, perfectly fine. It, it's kind of, I mean, he goes to the zoo, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I was talking to my, because I'm teaching a Dracula class right now, and I was talking to the students about, like, why is he in Whitby? And it's just like, is he wearing, like, you know, a seersucker suit and strolling along the pier and just playing carnival games and things during the day? What is he doing in Whitby? Because um, I, I, I also think of, um, I think of Sweeney Todd with that. I think about the uh, By the Sea song. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, is that is that what Dracula's up to? He's hanging out with... Uh, Sweeney Todd and Mrs. Lovett. And, Quite and possibly. Because it's a seaside <laughs> resort. Like, it's not where you would think of a vampire being. 
No, I mean, and you have that moment of, you know, the, the demeanor crashes and sinks and, and a large black dog was seen running yeah. away, but he's still there. So is he staying in dog form? Is he like, well, you know, I'm early. So uh, I'll, I'll take a weekend at the shore, a nice holiday. Well, that's the, the thing sun, with Bersica the sunlight doesn't kill too. Him. Because like, it, does he have like this affair with the female wolf from the zoo? Like what was the purpose of Bersica? <laughs> um, you did mention uh, the, the accent and I, I wanted to get your take on the accent work as another sort of uh, or dialect work here uh, on the part of Dracula. Because early on, the way it's described by Harker is he had a very unusual accent. Yes. Presumably Harker is used to the local accent of the people because he, he documents in like extraordinary detail all these things. So my my wondering is, and I've never seen it annotated and I've looked at the wolf, I've obviously looked at um, Leslie's book. Um, is Dracula trying out a British accent at that my point? My suspicion is, yeah, he's trying to pass. And... I mean, Harker's an unreliable narrator anyway, because he says, oh, yeah. well, I, I don't understand the local dialect. And then he immediately repeats, says what the, the the brides are saying. He understands Dracula, a peasant woman yells something. He's like, hey, why is she yelling? Man? Like, Dude, you don't speak that language. So we can kindly say Harker's an unreliable narrator. Dracula messed with his head, so he doesn't know what he remembers because he's jotting this all down in his diary later. But for the most part, when he's interacting with the Count, he's very impressed with him. But going back to our idea of the Count as performer, He's not only sort of holding forth on, you know, Romanian history and, and his own knowledge of historical events, but I think you're right. He's rehearsing for London. He's trying to pass as an able dinner companion, you know, at, at a club where he's a foreigner, but he's worked very hard to get rid of his accent. And so it's just that sort of hint of uh, Eastern European underneath an Eden clip, you know, the, anyone who's uh, any non-British person who has sent their child to be educated at a fine school uh, they come back with that sort of British with my native accent underneath it. And I think Dracula is trying to pull that sort of thing. Uh, you know, Dracula is that kid that does a, a semester in Britain and comes back with the accent. Uh, so he's getting or, ready to go over. Or Madonna, right? She bought a castle. Or, yes, or Madonna. British. It happens. <laughs> um, in terms of like that on the stage, like is this one of these like literary moments that's just unperformable? <laughs> Well, so much of the novel, frankly, is unperformable. Yeah. Um, and if you have someone who's trying out an accent, uh, well, the, the two things that occur to me are, one, we are so, so locked on the idea of that Lugosi accent that everyone has to do some kind of Eastern European accent if you're playing Dracula. And again, it's common sense. He's, he's from Romania, so he has a Romanian accent, except Dracula 31 didn't have a Romanian accent. He had a Hungarian accent because Bela Blasco's Hungarian. And people in America have no idea what different accents are mostly. So they're like, yeah, Bella, just talk like yourself. Good evening. And that to us has become Dracula. So if you were to stage a scene with someone trying to do that, I suspect they'd be like, why doesn't he sound like Dracula? Hmm. Or what, that actor was weird. Why was he doing that? <laughs> Instead of understanding on some level, you know, unless Dracula says, how British do I sound when I talk like this? <laughs> Hello. Or, you know, the problem is, I also think now that I'm doing it out loud myself, the possibility to descend into camp becomes too easy. It, it becomes vampiric, my fair lady. Uh, yeah, exactly. In Hartford, hurricanes ha fairly rarely happen. The rain and plains stays mainly. No, it doesn't. Right. No, no, you can't. But he wants Harker to do that with him. And yeah. so, I mean, but every, I was talking about this last night. I said, you know, almost everything in Dracula, the longer you keep him, with the audience, the more absurd he becomes as a character. It really is a problem. It, work, it works in the novel because of that cruelty and because he's off stage for much of it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's the model of the shark in Jaws. The second we, we see the shark fully on, it's no longer a horror movie. Now it's an action movie. Now we're hunting a big fish. It's scary that the big fish can eat us. But, you know, we, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, Lovecraft is highly problematic, but I think Lovecraft did get one thing right in supernatural horror and literature, and that's um, fear of the unknown. The scariest thing is what you don't know. The second you open that door and see what's behind it, okay, I can handle that. Uh, and so the more we see Dracula, the less scary he becomes. And maybe that, as I mentioned a couple times during, during my talk, maybe that's why vampires don't do it for me anymore, is seeing a lot of vampires. 
Sure. So Stakeland I found interesting because I'm like, oh, it's vampire. They're kind of zombie vampires, but that's new and different. Uh, 30 Days of Night. Okay, this is sort of post 9-11 terror vampires. That's something different. Uh, Dracula, I've seen. I've seen this vampire. I've seen Underworld. Okay, this is now just, you know, sexy fighting vampire in, in a skin tight latex bodysuit and lots of guns uh, with working class. That's the other thing that always strikes me in these, whether it's Twilight or um, Underworld or uh, True Blood, is that there's always like a supernatural vertical society that the vampires are the 1% and werewolves are working class proletariat guys. Hmm. Like, oh, we'll get the werewolves to do it. We're building a house. The werewolves will build the house. It's like, well, why is everyone crapping on werewolves, man? Surely there has to be one, the, the original Wolfman, you know, is, is, is the son of the local nobleman. Uh, and he's American. He just spent 18 years in America. So his accent goes away. I, I because again, he was played by Lon Cheney Jr. So who didn't have a British accent. So welcome back to Wales. Thanks, dad. <laughs> I, I, I wonder too, I mean, just uh, listening to the, the various things you were saying about the theater, some things you like about the theater, some things you've deployed in the theater, obviously. Uh, and it's just True. sort of like, you know, I, I, my, my mind trailed into uh, reading uh, theater and cruelty. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. In my graduate seminar, we're getting ready to talk about Arto, And I just had a student message me saying, Arto is blowing my mind and I love it. I want to try this. How do you do it? And I said, you know. <laughs> Hook up electrodes yeah. to the seats, right? <laughs> there, there, there's a lot of Arto in William Castle. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of art in terms of the theater should be experiential. The audience should be overwhelmed by the mise-en-scene. No more masterpieces. Stop trying to quote Hamlet. Instead, you know, do Aztec human sacrifice on stage and make sure the blood spatters the audience. Because Arto wanted the theater not to be this dry actors there, audience here, and we never meet. He wanted it to overwhelm and change and transform people who experienced it. Uh, he wanted it to be like a plague. It should ravage society and leave us exhausted, but healthier as a result. Uh, and of course, he then died in uh, in a madhouse. Yeah, I I do wonder if like if you embrace that and you do sort of, because that's almost like the anti Stoker, right? In terms of like oh, who he Stoker wanted to be. Oh, it as well. Yeah, and I'm I'm wondering if that's how you actually need to do it to make it effective uh, with with the resistance of camp. Yeah. If you're going to resist camp, if you want to stay away from camp, then uh, you probably do need to embrace Arto. You do need. And to be honest, our culture has when the 60, you know, Arto was ignored during his lifetime. Everyone's like, hey, that Frenchman's crazy. Uh, and then in, you know, in the 1960s, Peter Brook comes along and everyone's reading the theater and it's double. And it's like, oh, we are so doing his idea of the persecution and assassination of Jean-Paul Marat by the inmates of the uh, performed by the inmates of the asylum at Clarendon under the direction of Marquis de Sade. You know, and all these playwrights and theater people are like reading Arto going, oh, I want to do that. And so the 60s tries to explode theater and immediately we go back to, you know, we get hair by the end of it. But we go back to Broadway as, you know, when you look at sort of what won, what's winning the Tonys now, the things that are happening, even the things that are innovative are back to anti-Arto stuff. Mm -hmm. But the stuff that gets really exciting and innovative, things like Blue Man Group, things like Vampire Cowboys, the theater that I think make the audience really excited, where you're not just paying $100 to sit and watch other people sing and dance, but the stuff that really sort of overwhelms the audience and gives them an experience uh, tends to be Artodian. And in fact, our society is moving that way. The theme parks now, if you go to the new Star Wars rides at Disneyland, for example, it's not sit down and you, you do senseless velocity in a circle. Now it's, there's a story and you're a part of it. And we're going to pull you out of the ride and stormtroopers are going to escort you to the next area. And they're making it more performative and interactive. So theater in some ways, the best theater for my money is become, you know, the, the whole idea of immersive nights, you know, sleep no more, that, that you're not just sitting there and watching, you become immersed. The reason why people are embracing, at least until COVID, escape rooms is this notion of being a part of it and figuring things out. So the, the, the exciting theater that's happening right now is more immersive. And for that matter, the, the amusement parks are becoming more theatrical, that we're sort of meeting in this experiential culture, which is really exciting and dynamic. And eventually, once we perfect the technology, you know, we'll have a be a werewolf for a day. We're going to inject oh, you with this and transform you. And then you come out, we give you the antidote, and you can go buy a burger. That's the dream. Well, I mean, you got that. Uh, I mean, you completely jumped the shark a little here. Uh, you know, like, uh, are you familiar with, like, McKimmy Manor? Oh, good Lord, yes. McKimmy Manor. I mean, yeah, where, the, where it's like... bring a bag of dog food and they torture you for nine hours. Right, Where, but, it, you know, it's like, is it... 
what is it is it performative or not you know it, like, i mean it technically it is performative but anytime you need to have a defibrillator on hand and you know the the police are shutting you down because you're doing the things that that we have been decried for doing internationally we've left theater behind and we're now into something horrible but you know there's a, there's a waiting list allegedly of 10,000 people long to do it right so the the and now you know we're drifting into the idea here of extreme haunts and the notion that uh you know just walking through Universal Halloween Horror Nights, where there are actors in makeup carrying chainsaws without chains, or people dressed like Norman Bates who sort of follow you around. That doesn't do it anymore. We want things where the performers can touch you and where you are subject to things. And there are um, extreme haunts here in LA, for example, where you sign a waiver saying they, they can do whatever they want, and individual members of your party might be grabbed and dragged off to another part. And so not everyone experiences the same thing. And that's the other thing is the individuation of performance now that not everyone has the same experience. We all get dragged off to different places or we're allowed to perceive the show in different ways. And this is even outside the horror realm with things like Tony and Tina's wedding, where if you're in the bathroom when this character walks in, you have a conversation that no one else gets. So, you know, the some of the more exciting and innovative stuff that's being done in theater right now is about that idea of uh, individual interactive experience. No, I mean, it's, it, I'm just trying to like piece together in terms of like, because I think about this a lot. I think about like the mediation of where we are now versus where audiences were previously, right? And that's right. filmically, theater, anything, um, even just art in general. Um, and so, you know, you were talking about the, uh, the, the having the nurse in the theater, which of course William Castle also did. Yep. Um, and I think about that in relationship to sort of like, do we have to keep ratcheting up, you know, the volume on the experience or like, how, how do we demediate an audience in order to have like something that would have been authentic to the time when the original idea came forward uh, and particularly in the like realm of horror. Right. Cause for the longest time, um, like in the early 2000s, my, my example is always the reboot of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where yeah. the person shoots themselves in the head at the beginning, and we're actually the bullet going through the back of the head, right? It's the CSI mediation moment, where yeah. we have an impossible amount of information. <laughs> and it's like, wh what, what does that mean? That's the level of expectancy in that level of information, and, and yeah. how much does that kill sort of horror in a live performance setting? as a possibility. Well, the one thing the live performance setting has always is that is that presence and that shared space and that liveness. It's happening right there in front of you. And there, you know, when you were sitting there watching that Texas Chainsaw Massacre moment, as I, you know, when I went to see that in the theater, my first response was, <laughs> okay. You know, it's, it's so over the top. Uh, it, it, it's, at the risk of being unkind. It's a pure Fangoria moment. It's designed for Fangoria fans to be like, yeah. Um, and if you own and read the annotated edition of Dracula, you're maybe not going for that vibe. Uh, and horror, I mean, my theory of horror is horror is like Los Angeles. It's got a downtown and, and 81 different neighborhoods. And so Texas Chainsaw Reboot is horror as is the Babadook. Sure. And yet these two are not very close at all. They're dealing with, with things that make us unsettled, things that make us uh, uncomfortable in very different ways. In my own humble, I, I don't know if we can unring the bell of demediatization. I mean, if you go to you know, Colonial Williamsburg, you can now take a self-guided tour with an app, just as they did back in the 19th, 18th, 18th century during colonial so, times. So I went to William & Mary for undergrad. Ah. And... <laughs> So I, I took religion classes, which were in the Ridden building, right? This sort of Christopher Ridden building. And you'd have yes. tourists walk in every once in a while and look at us, you know, in class, because they weren't supposed to come into the classroom. They were just like appalled, I think, that we weren't in powdered wigs and writing with like. And again, I don't, the, you can't step in the same river twice to misquote Heraclitus. So I don't, you can't even get an authentic experience at Colonial Williamsburg if you put your phone away because you're still surrounded by everything and plus your own context. Art doesn't mean it generates meaning. And half of that meaning comes from you being there, not just what the artist does, but what the audience brings to it. So you, the fact that you're still thinking about an email in Colonial Williamsburg means you're not demediatized. You're just not focusing on it at the moment. 
So as, as an artist, one of the things that I try to do is go, okay, we, we can't de it. We can't pull the media out. So how do we use it more effectively? And the funny thing is some of these old techniques are very effective. And as I mentioned, performing live, you're in the same room with the person. And in fact, that I've used when I, every year I turn my university into a haunt, my university library into a literary haunted house. You walk through and instead of people jumping out and yelling boo, they jump out and do a scene from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde saying, but there's an old Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde trick where under red light, red makeup is invisible, but under green light, it turns black. So if you have an actor who is wearing red makeup and you light the room all red, they, the audience can't just see a person. And then as the light slowly turns green, they see a beard grow, they see the eyebrows become much more bushy, they see scars form as the actor doubles over and screams, they slip in false teeth. And literally Hyde became, Jekyll became Hyde five feet from you, right in front of you, and you don't know how we did it. You know, we levitate people, uh, we have people disappear and reappear somewhere else. And again, these are all old magician's tricks. You can find them online. But even when you know how it's done, we have a levitation device. I know how it's done. But when I watch it, I'm still like, damn, that's so cool. <laughs> because it just looks really, really effective. And so it's one thing to watch a movie where someone suddenly their eyes roll back in their head and they rise up in the air five feet. It's another thing to be standing 10 feet from the person when they do it. And then their head lolls forward. They look you right in the eye and say, do you know what day you're going to die? And it really freaks people out because again, a direct address. I'm, I'm not, this isn't the screen talking to you. This is a physical presence looking right at you and asking you if you want to know about your own death. Uh, and we ha we ha we've had people have very negative reactions to that moment where they start crying. And we're like, this is just a very simple effect with a student actor. But the, the moment becomes really kind of scary for folks. So sometimes the simplest tricks demediatize in the moment because they're so used to CG effects and so used to seeing, you know, the, the transformation in front done through, through computers that when we have very simple practical effects, audiences aren't used to it. And they're certainly not used to it happening in person right in front of them. So the, that would be the other reason why I say I think theater can be more effective at being scary sometimes. There's a reason why people, you know, go to Universal Horror, for example, and scream Universal Horror Nights. Uh, or the Queen Mary, or Not Scary Farm. Again, I'm in Southern California. And that's that live experience. You're in the room with the performers. I remember being, I must have been 10 or 11, going to local JC's Haunted House. I grew up in a small Norman Rockwell painting in Connecticut. The local JC's would hold, host a haunted house. And I was a huge horror fan. So it didn't, you know, it didn't scare me. People were going through and screaming. And there was a man in kind of a, I guess I would call it a werewolf mask. I just made eye contact with him and he just started staring at me. I looked away, I looked back, and he was still staring at me. I looked away, I looked back, and he was still staring at me. And he took one step for me, and all rational thought just went away. I'm like, I don't, I know this isn't real, but I don't want to be in this room anymore. And I think that was very formative for me, because I'm like, oh, that's powerful. I know it's not real. I probably know who that guy is if he takes off his mask. Again, small town, but in this moment, nope. I, you know, I noped it out of there. Nope, 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 nope. I'm good. I'm done. So, so it's those uh, simple moments, those contact moments where you can convince yourself the monster might be real. So with all this in mind and all this, uh, you know, in terms of like knowing the plot of Dracula, uh, which, which we've gotten a lot to here, um, yes. what does it mean that 10 year old children are performing Dracula? Well, I think that, that's just it is we, we've really, pardon the pun, defanged him that the, the original novel is still horrifying and horrific, but, but because each generation views the previous generation horror as cute. You know, my grandfather went to see the original Universal films when they came out and he was like 20 and he's like, oh, those films were really scary. He's like, oh, you shouldn't watch that. That's too scary. And here I am a 10 year old watching it going, by scary, do you mean boring? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, Friday the 13th over here, Jason is scary. And when I talk to my students today, they're like, yeah, no. I teach a horror cinema class, and sometimes they I'm the first, you know, I, I'm the first person to make them watch The Exorcist and Night of the Living Dead and John Carpenter's The Thing, and they come in, and some of them are like, "That was super scary," and some of them are like, "Yeah, I'm sorry. Have you seen Paranormal Activity or Insidious? Like, those are scary movies. Like, wait, you think that's scarier than The Exorcist? Because it's a generational thing. So Dracula was encountered by the boomers on television first. Dracula on a big screen probably was really kind of terrifying. And Nosferatu, you know, scared audiences when it premiered at the Berlin Theater Garden in 22. But once you put it on TV, once it's a small screen thing interrupted every eight to 10 minutes 
buy commercials for, you know, home goods and cigarettes. And this is, again, it's back in the fifties, you know, that any, that, that sort of pace that drives the horror forward completely gets lost, you know, here, what's behind this door, creak it open. We'll be right back after these messages. And then you come back and the door opens, but you've completely lost any tension. So if that's your Dracula and Bella Lugosi is your Dracula, you know, by the end of his life, Lugosi is playing Dracula on television in comedy sketches. Oh, yeah. He's playing Dracula in, for all practical Plan purposes, nine from outer Dracula space. in Plan 9 from Outer Space, <laughs> and then dies and is replaced by Ed Wood's chiropractor who looks nothing like him. So, well, he doesn't have to. He's walking around like this the whole time. <laughs> yeah. And that's another film that I show to my students who are like, how did this film get made? And we, we talk about how it got made and what it was and how... The funny thing is there is a lot of plan nine vibe going on right now in terms of the DIY film culture that anyone, there are things on Netflix that I'm like, plan nine is probably a better movie than this. I mean, it's certainly better than the, uh, the BBC Netflix Dracula series that you uh, spoke about. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> so, the, you know, in just the same way, it's hard to unmediate the horror life. It's hard to de- it's hard to refang Dracula. And that's why, you know, there, there are sort of other attempts, no spoilers, because I think people are still encountering it, but there are moments in Midnight Mass that I thought, oh, that's actually really effective. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike Flanagan's Midnight Mass, people either love it or hate it. I fall into the love camp. I'm like, oh, this is actually really effective horror. That's also highly philosophical. Some of the, some of the conversations go on a bit long, but overall, you know, to be a horror fan is the triumph of hope over experience. You're like, well, Nightmare on Elm Street 5 has got to be good, right? I mean, the past two weren't, but this one will. Well, the reboot of Dracula has to be scary, right? Like, it's the triumph of hope over experience. You keep going, going, I hope this. And that's that, I think, keeps us going because you do that, not just for love of the genre, but you do that for the gem that you didn't know about that you find and go, wow, this actually really scared me. And as Clive Barker says, there is no delight, the equal of dread. When, when a horror fan finds something that's genuinely scary, we're happy. So that's that's what I think of myself as doing, increasing the happiness in the world. I think I think that's a good I think that's a good conclusion note for us. No argument um, here. <laughs> I, I I thank you very much for your patience and those of you out there oh, for your patience. No, with thank all the, the audience. Uh, with, with, with all the gremlins we've had in the last two evenings. Um, I invite you to tune in tomorrow night. We have Rachel Harrison. She'll be premiering her new novel, Cackle, and doing a, a reading from that. Uh, until next time, stay spooky. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, again, I'm sorry we had a, a, a pause there, but uh, it is amusing to me that I sort of like knew you by proxy oh, dear. <laughs> 10 years ago. That is funny that you came to see that. Yeah, it's the LA theater horror, horror theater community is remarkably small and uh, you got Wicked Lit up in, uh, up in the valley. You've got the Grand Guignolers who haven't done anything in a few years. And of course, Zombie Joe is always cooking something up he does a new urban death every year but other than that everything else is catch as catch can so there are fun horror things like reanimated the musical and i just did um two years ago i i, I just directed toxic avenger the musical for boomstick oh, yes. so that was a lot of fun and uh an I, i'm very interested in uh, peter dicklidge as uh toxy yes <laughs> he's that, also playing nice. cyrano there are so many interesting things that he's got coming out soon yeah that, that's that, yeah i saw um First name's Doug. He was in uh, La Caja Full with Kelsey Grammer. Oh, Douglas Hodge. Yes, thank you. I saw I saw him in Cyrano. Interesting. It was you know as traditional as picturing it. theater can get. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Cyrano is one of those old war horse pieces that you know most actors are like. I wish to assail this role sometime because it's sword fighting. You get lovely language and you die a hero. Uh but uh, I think the only time I've seen it when I was much, much younger, uh, I had, I had uh, some family friends take me to see Richard Chamberlain in it. And uh, he was quite good, at least to my nine-year-old mind. Uh, when I encountered the text a little older, I'm like, oh, I, 